If I were to ask you this morning, how do you know that you are saved from your sins? What would your answer be? Answer, think about it. Take a moment, think about it. What would that answer, what would your answer to that question be? How do you know you are saved from your sins? Another way to get the ball rolling here, if I were to say, how do you know that you are going to heaven when your time on earth comes to an end? How would you answer that question? Take a moment, think about it. Well, I can imagine if you were not awake yet, you are certainly awake now, thinking of the answers to those questions. Not often that I give pop quizzes on Sunday mornings, especially ones with eternal value, but we continue now with our quiz. But I'll give you the answer to the first one. There's some building blocks here. I would hope that most everyone, if not everyone, would answer the question this way. I know that I am saved and know that I believe and that I have faith in Jesus Christ for all that he has done for me. I see a few head nods. That's good. That's the answer to the first question. So let me now ask you a second question. Why do we need to have faith in Jesus Christ? Why do we need to have faith? In Jesus Christ. Again, take a couple of seconds, think about what your answer to that question would be. I can hear the thinking, it's going well. Hopefully your answer sounds something like this, I have faith in Jesus Christ because he is the son of God and he came to earth, he took on flesh and he lived a perfect life. And then he gave his life for mine on the cross so that I, all of us, could be forgiven of our sins. All right, third and last question on the pop quiz. We always save the hardest question for last, and here it is. What happened on the cross that made the forgiveness of our sins possible? What happened on the cross that made the forgiveness of our sins possible? Or another way of saying it, why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Now, I'm going to give you the short answer to that question. I know that's a hard question. I think a lot of times as Christians, we know the answer to the first one and maybe the second one, but when we get to the how of all this happened, we think, ooh, I really don't know. I know I need to believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus was the son of God, that he came to the earth, lived a perfect life, and then he died on a cross for me. But how did that happen? What happened on the cross that made all of this possible? This is the foundation, the bedrock of everything we believe. And the short answer to that question, why did Jesus die on a cross? Is because Jesus atoned for our sin. Okay, Jesus atoned for our sins. And I get the word atone is not one we use in our everyday vernacular or conversation anymore, but atone means to make amends. Okay, atone means to make amends. And then who did we need to make amends with? You can answer this one out loud. God, we need to make amends with God. And why? It's because of our sin. Right? Our God is a perfect and holy God, and we are not. God is God, and we are not. God is perfect, and he is holy, and there is nothing that you or I could possibly do, despite our best efforts and our best intentions, there is nothing that you or I could do to make amends with God. But because God loves each of us so much, God did. God did what none of us could ever do despite our wanting to. And because God did that, it changed everything forever. Now that's the short answer. Jesus died on the cross to atone or to make amends for our sin with God. That's the short answer. I hope you remember that from this morning. But we're going to take the next six weeks to answer that question a little more fully. And it's not just enough time on Sunday mornings for the 18 to 22 minutes that Pastor Rick and I have to answer that question. That's why we're having the Bible studies on Wednesday nights. We're going to be meeting March 8th, so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. And if you come on the first night, there's a bonus because we're buying pizza for everyone who comes. 
Not a single person cheered. Not one. Not one person cheered for free pizza. Well, you come, you get free pizza, and we're going to be talking about uh, this every single week and just go more in depth than what we have time to do on Sunday mornings. Because to describe what Jesus did on the cross, to fully understand the magnitude of this event, pastors, scholars, theologians, everyday believers, people who don't believe in Jesus at all, they have spent the last 2,000 plus years trying to figure out the how of the cross. Because there is no direct answer in Scripture of how Jesus dying on the cross changed everything forever. But out of that study, after those conversations, and all of these are rooted in Scripture, people throughout the history and life of, our, of the church have come up with what are called atonement theories, okay? And now these theories, they are human-initiated attempts. That's an important phrase to remember, human-initiated attempts to describe what the divine, or God, has done through Jesus on the cross. And they all work. They all work together to describe what some would say, and I agree with them, is the most important work in all of the human story, all throughout history. And that work is God bringing us back into right relationship with him. Because remember, we can't do that. Only God can do that. And so we use our human language. That's all we've got. So we use our human language and we use imperfect words and phrases to begin to describe what God has done through Jesus and what God continues to do in our world today. Essentially, what we're going to be doing over the next many weeks is describing and deepening our theology of the cross our theology of the cross. Now, don't let that word theology scare you away. I promise not to put you to sleep. And theology is really God talk. When people say, my theological opinion of this is, that just means the way I think about God is this. And we all have our own theology. That what we were raised in or what we picked up as an adult or what a mentor or a pastor has told us, it all helps shape our individual theology, and my theology is different than yours, and that's okay. And yet we still agree on the most foundational things, and a theology of the cross being one of the most foundational. And my hope is that when we leave worship on Easter Sunday, six Sundays from now, and we have talked about our last theory, my hope is that you will say, I now have a deeper, a more robust theology of the cross, and I love Jesus so much more than I ever knew I could. Because this idea of talking about theology and doctrine every single Sunday for six weeks, it kind of sounds like, ooh, I don't know. But it's so worth it. Because if we can't answer that most fundamental question of why did Jesus have to die on the cross, I don't know why other, anyone else would want to listen to anything we have to say. So this series, it's called Savior. And I want to give a shout out to the person whose book we're using that I'm basing this series off of. Uh, his name is Reverend McGray de Vega. Uh, McGray is the senior pastor at Hyde Park United Methodist Church, which is just about an hour north of us. And McGray is in the Florida Conference like I am, and he is uh, someone I respect a great deal. He holds a lot of key leadership positions within the church, and his writing and his theology has opened my eyes to so many things that I had forgotten or did not even know. And that's why we were so excited to bring this series to our church during Lent, because there's so much depth and there's so much to learn. And I promise you, if you were here and you dive in, you take notes and you listen and you study this and you think about it, you will love Jesus more on Easter Sunday. So to begin, you've probably noticed the big cross over here. It's draped in purple. Uh, Purple is the liturgical color of the season. And so you'll see more and more purple around our worship space in the weeks to come. And up top, we have written the word substitute, because that is the name of the first theory that we're going to study this week. And each week, the name on the top of that cross will change depending on the theory that we are talking about. As you probably guessed, there are six weeks, so we'll be talking about six theories. 
Now, it's important for you to hear me say from the very first day, and I'll say it every single week, no single one of these theories is absolutely certain or absolutely right. They are all rooted in scripture. They all have support by pastors and theologians. I'm not pulling a bait and switch on you. There's no heresy involved in any of this, but all of them help us understand better why Jesus died on the cross. So now that you know what we're doing and where we're going and how we're doing it, let's begin by talking about our first theory, which is probably the most prevalent theory of them all, especially in our American Christianity. And uh, rightly so, it is rooted in Scripture, both in the Old and New Testaments, and we're going to look at those. It has a great deal of support from scholars and theologians from a long, long time ago and still active in the church today, but... By our modern standards, it's the hardest to wrap our head around. It's the hardest to say, really? Is that really what this is? And the theory is called substitutionary atonement. I know that's a big phrase, substitutionary atonement. And it's the notion that Jesus became for us what the sacrificial system demanded of the Israelites in the Old Testament. All right, hang in here with me. You remember the first five books of the Bible are called the Torah or the books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are 613 Levitical laws. And in early Bible times and in that culture and in that society, if someone did something wrong or if you sin, God required the shedding of innocent blood for the sins of the people. Now, we don't do that anymore. That sounds very different to us. That sounds very barbaric. That sounds very out of line. And yet that's how the world was. So if you did this sin, you had to atone or make amends by doing this type of sacrifice. Or if you did that sin, you had to do this thing to be atoned and to make amends with your neighbor and with God. And that was the practice. And I think if we take a step back and we look at the world we live in today, we still live in a very rules-based system in society. We don't sacrifice lambs at altars anymore, but we do different things. Prime example, if you break the law, you are going to get a fine, you're going to go get probation, you're going to have to go to a judge, and maybe you end up in jail. But after you do your time, you pay your fines, you do your community service, you have atoned for what you did, and you get to re-enter society. Or on a more personal level, when your three-year-old doesn't listen, you put them in timeout, right? And they sit there and they listen and then they are perfect afterwards, right? (laughs) Well, move along. (laughs) But you get it. You break a rule, you do something, and you are forgiven and you start again. That's how the system worked. That's how God worked with the Israelites and the nation of Israel. That's our Old Testament foundation for the substitution theory. But then we get to the New Testament. Like I said, this just isn't that uh, part of the Bible. We get to the New Testament, and Peter and Paul, uh, two of the primary figures in the New Testament, wrote the majority of it between the two of them. They use substitutionary language frequently, and they use it after their own personal experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because the resurrection means everything. For example, let's start by looking at Peter. Remember, Peter's the one that loved Jesus the most. He loved to say how much he loved Jesus. And he's the one, before Jesus was betrayed, Jesus told him, he said, three times, three times you will deny knowing me before the rooster crows. And he had bravado. He was the one that, I will never betray you, Jesus. And then he was one of the first to do it. But after his experience of knowing Jesus in the resurrection, in chapter 2, verse 21 to 24 of his letter, he writes this. And listen for the substitution language. For to this, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Then Paul, 
who calls himself, remember Paul, the greatest missionary ever, wrote half the New Testament. He says about himself in one of his letters, he says, I am the chief among all sinners. It's quite the title. If you want to borrow that title, I'm sure you can. The chief among all sinners. And he had the resume to back it up. You remember before he was Paul, he was Saul. And he had blood on his hands as he was vicious towards the early followers of Jesus Christ before he met Jesus on the Damascus road that night. And that's a sermon for another day. But after his experience and his conversion and knowing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he wrote this in Romans chapter three. Remember, he's writing this to the empire, the powerful and the most affluent people. He's writing this in chapter three. He says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Oh, we have to remember that all lent long. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But <coughs> they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 says, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to demonstrate at the present time his own righteousness so that he is righteous and he justifies the one who has faith, of, has the faith of Jesus. Now, you might not have caught this, but when he's talking about this, he is talking to a Jewish audience, trying to convince them to believe in Jesus and that he is uh, the final sacrifice. And so he's referring, again, to the first five books of the Bible. He's referring to the story in Exodus. You remember in the plagues where God said, put the blood of a lamb over your doorpost and your firstborn child will be spared. Paul's telling that to them to remind them, remember what God did before? God did that again in a new and in a final way in Jesus Christ. And as he said, as a substitute. Both Peter and Paul, after experiencing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, described the work of Jesus as assuming the punishment that should have been theirs and ours to bear. One of my all-time favorite stories uh, that's been turned into a movie, I'd imagine a lot of us have seen it, it's called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. I see a few smiles remembering that book and that movie, but maybe you didn't know that C.S. Lewis, the author, uh, early in his life, he was an atheist, wanted nothing to do with God, did not believe in God, and then after he had his conversion and knew about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he continued to be a prolific author and storyteller, but this time he started doing it for the faith. And one of the great stories, again, is the lion, witch, and the wardrobe. And quickly, I'll tell you, in the story, there are four siblings, and they go through the wardrobe into this faraway land. And in the very beginning, the, one of those four siblings, one of the brothers, he gets tricked, he gets deceived, he gets lured and chooses the bad side or the wrong side and then becomes trapped by the ice queen who represents evil or who represents the devil. The other three siblings go the other way and they become close with Aslan, who is the lion who represents the savior, who represents Jesus. And towards the end of the first movie, Aslan comes forward and says to the ice queen, take me in his place so that he can be spared and he could be rescued. Take me instead of him. You see where I'm going with this? And the scene, it's hard. I, I didn't feel comfortable sharing it in worship this morning because they capture Aslan. Well, he gives himself willingly, but they, they tie him up and there's all these strange creatures that are chanting and yelling and mocking him. Does that sound familiar as well? And then they cut off his mane to embarrass him. And then right before the ice queen uh, lowers her knife, she kneels down and she whispers into Aslan's ear. She says, you know, I'm a little disappointed in you. Did you honestly think that you could save the humans? You are giving me your life and saving no one. She then laughs and says, so much for love. 
She then kills him. The crowd goes absolutely wild and they say, we're going to war the next day and bad will defeat good and evil will overcome once and for all. The scene ends, everyone clears out. But the next day, two of the siblings, they go back to this stone table where Aslan was sacrificed for their brother and they experience something pretty incredible. And I wanna show you that clip and that clip of hope this morning and see if you can connect it to our story of the cross as well. Take a look at this. We should go. Which knew the true meaning of sacrifice. She might have interpreted the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack. And even death itself would turn backwards. We sent the news that you were dead. Peter and Evan will have gone to war. We have to help them. We will, dear one. But not alone. Climb on my back. We have far to go, and little time to get there. And you may want to cover your ears. Aslan, like Jesus, rose from the dead. And then they went on to win that battle the next day, and good defeated once and for all. And I love the line, he says, when a willing victim is convicted, convicted, that has done no treachery and killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack or the curtain will be torn in two and even death itself will turn backwards. I wonder when we think about Jesus on the cross as our substitute, does that sound familiar? You see, the substitution atonement theory, it's a prevalent one and it's a, a popular one, but it's a, it's a difficult one to wrap our heads around because it is very violent. And this story, it is violent and it's painful to hear. But in the next several weeks, we're gonna look at five other theories and they'll help you understand Jesus's profound love for us as well. That he, yes, is a substitute and endured what we might have had to endure, but it's so much more than that as well. But as you think about what Christ has done for you and how Christ is continuing to work in your life, I want to share what should our response be to all of this. And this will be the same every week, but especially on this week. The proper response for each of us is gratitude. It's for us to say thank you to God, to say thank you to Jesus for all that he has done for us. Jesus endured that so that we don't have to. Jesus did what we could never do for ourselves. Jesus assumed the full punishment that was ours to incur. Jesus took our place. Jesus was our substitute. And this week, as you're thinking about that, and I encourage you to just think about the depths of God's love for you, 
and the willingness that Jesus had to do that for us. He took the weight of your sin, of my sin, the sin of all humanity. And when we reflect on that, the only response is to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And then we go forth every day and live our lives full of gratitude and passing along this good news for all to hear. In a dark world, in a broken world, in a, in a hurting world, we have light and hope. And we go forth to share it with others. Let's pray.